Hello, folks. This is Joe from My Geek Scene. I'm at Midwest Media Expo. I'm standing. Oh, standing. Yeah, okay. I'm sitting right next to Kyle Hebert. Hello. Prominent voice actor. Um, Aizen Sosuke from Bleach and Teen Gohan? Or yeah, more along Teen lines? slash Adult Gohan. Older. Yeah, yeah and the narrator. Yes. And the narrator as well. And Bulma's father? Well, Ox King. Ox King. Yeah, Gigi's Chi's Dad, Chi Chi, uh, sorry, I'm an idiot yeah, on that tons one. Tons of stuff. Uh, Ryu and Street Fighter and Wreck It Ralph for 10 seconds. Uh, Kamina and Gurren Lagan. Um, tons of games, tons of shows through the years and over a span of 16 years so far. Yes. You used to work in anime extensively. Or oh, yeah. You used to work for Funimation, correct? Yeah, still do, actually. I still show up in One Piece as Capone. Um, in some of the more recent episodes, isn't Capone the uh, the mafia type pirate that has oh, yeah. like little miniature ones come out? I do, I think so. Or did yeah. I just spoil it for you? What? I read a lot of the manga. What can I say? Oh, that's okay. We're thankful for people like you that that read the manga and watch the shows, and then check it out in English and keep the industry alive. You know, it's a good thing. Well, speaking of anime, what was your first exposure to anime? Not as a voice actor, yeah. but just as you. Okay, well, I'm going to be 47 this June, which means I'm old. We go back to the 70s when I'm growing up, and Speed Racer was okay. a big part of my daily uh, animation consumption. And the word anime did not exist at that point. I, uh, and then Star Wars comes out, and then there was a big boom from networks and children's programming to bring a sci-fi spin to things. So they, they got the rights to things like Star Blazers and Battle of the Planets, which was Gotcha Man in, in, ja in Japan. Uh, and then in high school, Robotech first came out, which I thought was a genius creation of three completely unrelated anime series spliced together to make one cohesive whole. Wasn't part of that Macross Plus? Yeah, I believe so. And uh, Mospita and maybe one other. Um, but Carl Masek, the, the late great Carl Masek, was kind of behind all that. And then, of course, Akira, Akira uh, came out and changed, uh, opened a lot of eyes. And uh, I remember just falling in love with all sorts of things like Vampire Hunter D, Ghost in the Shell. Did you ever see Bloodlust? I did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and that was one of those rarities uh, where it came out in English. That was the original language. It was produced in Japan, but English was the primary language. I thought that was actually not a bad sequel. Um, I remember when I was younger, when I watched uh, Vampire Hunter D, I was terrified of that at first, you know, because especially yeah. the cows running through the field and the plasma creatures come, uh, the mist like creatures just yeah. shredding them. And I was like, wow. It's you know, very trippy, some psychedelic stuff in there. And then the dub's pretty funny, actually. <laughs> but uh, I think since then, they, they, they matured things and a little more serious in Bloodlust. Of course, it's drop dead gorgeous animation and yes. everything. And I heard they're possibly making another one. Uh, hey, I wouldn't be opposed to that. I I love that stuff and Helsing. I love Helsing. Um, original or Ultimate? I have only seen the original thirteen episodes. I have not seen Ultimate, and I'm in Ultimate for a little bit. Yes, and I was going to touch upon that. Yeah, a little bit later. Oh, okay. Yes. Wait for it. <laughs> yes, uh, this man's done interviews before. My goodness, just a few. Uh, good segues. No, Helsing Ultimate, uh, that follows the manga more to a T. And, right. I um, mean, the original 13, they didn't introduce the Nazi vampires. Mm. I mean, at the very end, they did. The very last episode, it was yeah. like uh, foreshadowing what's coming. Mm -hmm. In this, they actually explore the whole arc and finish up the, oh, okay. the whole thing. Like, all, it's 10 OVAs, actually. <laughs> okay. Or OAVs. Nice. However, however you want to look at it. You were Aizen Sosuke yeah. on um, Bleach. What were your thoughts on him? Well, they told me um, when I auditioned that uh, you see the audition side, picture of the character, a little description, maybe basically a paragraph saying that he's mysterious yet friendly. We're not sure about his motives. And what that sparked in my mind, without watching shows in Japanese at all, I just see what's in front of me in the audition script and try to make some sort of uh, thing and commit to it. I was reminded of the computer HAL 9000 from the film 2001 A Space Odyssey, who is his friendly voice, but uh, he did things like pull the life support on all the astronauts on the ship and, you know, things like, I'm sorry, Dave, I can't do that. And that's kind of the basis for the voice, and I decided to do that. 
and um, that's how he ended up sounding. And, and I've heard a little bit in Japanese, and that's kind of like this, this, you know, oh, so god, you know, all this, this deep bass, seductive, friendly. But yeah, you, can I trust this guy? And uh, yeah, I was no. pretty much no, you, you cannot. No, you cannot. And I was told from the beginning. It said, "Congratulations, you got the big baddie of the show." And He's going to spoilers. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's introduced and you think he's a good guy. And then he pulls over this whole stunt and makes people think he died. And then he comes back and like, ah, all part of the plan, you know. So, yeah, so much fun to play a villain, especially one that's so chill. I was going to ask next, do you enjoy playing villains more? Yeah, well, you know, what I honestly love doing, and I've always wanted to be a voice actor since I was a kid, was just voice cartoons. You know, zany, cr wacky things. And Ox King and Dragon Ball Z is the closest thing I've come to, <laughs> to getting to realize that dream. But honestly, any and just, just flexing your skills as an actor, whatever they throw at you, I enjoy the challenge. It, uh, going to the booth is a new, fun exercise in wackiness or seriousness or whatever i just have a 110 percent commitment when i get in that booth and i'm so thankful to have that kind of job where it you know you're lifting words off the page after having only seen them a matter of seconds before performing them as if you've memorized them which you don't need to because it's voice acting and scripts always in front of you i like that okay what are your thoughts on gohan's character evolution throughout the series from z to now up to super yeah well i, mean, I know super still being made as we speak that's true and in fact as of the recording of this very interview there's still no news about the actual licensing of the show we're all waiting the whole cast is like we we're, we're dying we're chomping at the bit to return to these characters that are very beloved and obviously having two hit movies you know over the past two years battle of gods and resurrection f both performing quite well in the theaters thank you fans uh to even green lit green light super in the first place you know that's a fantastic uh, thing, and we've we've had a lot of success over the years by redubbing the show and then putting out multiple video games. Uh, but yeah, we're we're really excited to see where that goes. Of course, me voicing Gohan, you know, that was my first big role as a voice actor, having you know uh, belonging, uh, being a part of that franchise to this day, and having it impact so many lives. Come to the convention scene, it's like, dude, you voiced my childhood. It's like, holy crap, that's really cool. I'm like in the pantheon of like Optimus Prime and stuff. You know, <laughs> it's like people are like, oh, my God, Optimus Prime. You know, like Peter Cullen and legends of the uh, of that ilk. And Billy West, who is here at this convention this weekend. Nice dude. An idol, an idol uh, that I just idolize. Amazing talent. These people. But anyway, to answer your question, Gohan, I absolutely want to see. I want to see him. Rise to power. No, I want to see him uh, see his actually realize his full potential as, as a strong character because we were going that way. And if you saw the end of Z, I, yeah, just took a left turn. And then uh, he goes back to studying books and, and it's like, no, come on. After all this buildup, after all these years, you see him as a kid and then a preteen and a teenager, and then an adult. And like, I'm just going to go read. Like, really? Well, you can blame Chi Chi for that, though. Chi Chi. Chi Chi, what's up? You come on. You know, and then you get into GT, and oh, we just don't talk about it. It's like Fight Club. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully, Super will just retcon that out of existence since it seems like. I, well, I think the, uh, that, yeah. Akira Toriyama said that Super was the true sequel to. The true. Okay. So well. GT does it really exist, I guess. Oh, okay. So. You've mentioned on your website that anime voiceovers are low paying. Does the pay balance out on long running series such as Naruto and One Piece? I guess if you do the math, if you have a long running major character who shows up in a lot of episodes, then yeah. Like Luffy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're the main cast that's in every episode, yeah, that's, that's a nice paycheck. I was like, what's your favorite gig? Job security. That's my favorite one. Job security is the most amazing series of all time. Um, yeah, yeah, obviously things can be lucrative over the course of years <laughs> with, a, with a case of anime. Uh, but making appearances and people wanting to you know, pay you for your time to travel the world and do all that. It's like, wow, that, that's some pretty sweet residual action there. Um, and, you know, I, I don't do this for the money. I do this because I love what I do as a career. I love getting to voice these characters 
and uh, having it resonate again with the fandoms for, for generations. Now, new people watching a bridge series are getting introduced to DBZ for the first time, and, and different and different shows too, One Piece and everything. And man, it's just it's so much fun. I I wouldn't change anything, but yeah, the. Uh, if you cobble all the recording projects together, yeah, as a freelance artist, that's what voice acting is. You're freelance. You just live project to project, check to check. Um, yeah, yeah. Between combination of conventions and video games and anime, I have been able to say, yeah, look, I'm able to, to lead a pretty decent lifestyle that thanks to awesome. what I do. And, it, you know, again, I'm in my mid-40s. But, you know, I stayed committed to doing this as I would always advise anyone to do if they're whatever their dream is. Just stick to it because, you know, you want to get rich in your soul, not in your pocketbook. You know, your life is so much more meaningful and satisfying if you're doing something you love for a living as opposed to making six figures but being stressed out and hating your boss or something. You know, you don't want to do that. Um, well... Uh, I would have to say, nice job on the Christopher Walken cameo in Helsing Ultimate. Oh, we thank did you. That earlier. That's right. It's crazy. Talison Jaffe, the director, goes, "Do you do walking?" It's like, it's funny you ask. I actually do walk in from time to time. But I mean, everyone does the bad walking. Everyone does the impression of what they think walking actually sounds like, and you know, very few people <laughs> actually do a just a spot on walking. That's not with the Shatnerian pauses and all that stuff. But yeah, it, it was cool. It's like, it's like, I mean, I'm Christopher Walken. You know, it's a quick line. Like Kevin Pollack, he does a pretty good Walken impression. Oh, yes, he does. Yes, he does. Done a great comedian there, yeah. Yes. All right, we're going to switch over to video games for a little bit. Yes. And then switch over to a little bit more serious as we're wrapping this up. All right. All right. Um, since you are the voice of Ryu, have you ever watched Street Fighter II, the animated movie, and your thoughts on that? I have not. I've only seen little parts of it. I did an interview where we would kind of give commentary to different scenes. Uh, I would love to. It looks like a it's like awesome. a camp classic. Uh, <laughs> no, it's it's not campy at all. Actually, no, for it's like legit a, cool. Like for a a movie based on a video game property, mm -hmm. it actually did it justice. And that's so rare because you've seen the live action people butcher anime and and game adaptations and it's just like wow no, this is like i i would put that up there as like uh upper tier level as far as a video game adaption i mean mo anime adaption of a video game yeah okay i would highly recommend that because when you have live action adaptation of anime you know that that gets a little wonky but yeah street fighter with van damme that's a camp classic you know it's it's, oh, it's no. funny for all the wrong reasons no but, but yeah please watch the, the animated street fighter 2 okay animated movie i yeah. mean and like they've actually i when i first purchased it, i bought the pg-13 version i didn't know there was an r-rated uncut version oh yes stuff. with gratuitous slow-mo um chun li in a shower right is well that, that didn't get it for that but there was actually more blood you know from oh the there is as okay well. you know when ryu did a. Uh, uh, they showed how Sagat got the scar across his chest. Oh, okay. So it starts off like Ryu and Sagat are in this dark field and it's thundering. Yeah. And like you see grass just waving from uh, the wind and you know and they're fighting and then like Sagat was going to you know do a stomp on him and Ryu did the Shoryuken, blood, you know. Oh, and I was nice. like, wow. I mean, like even just thinking about it, it's like the music from that just gives me goosebumps. Oh, cool. I would highly recommend that. You All know, right. But I know you're busy. But yeah, not enough hours in the day to even play the games I'm in. But <laughs> I do have to touch up on two things as yeah. we're leaving. Um, ending this, you're writing a book with your fiance, right or wrong? What is it about? Oh yeah, yeah. So it does help to attend panels. Oh right, exactly. Uh, yeah, my fiance, her her pen name is Right or Wrong because she usually writes controversial things. Like uh, her first book is out now called Ireland Calls My Name about Irish slavery. Something. Very few people in North America seem to be aware of when the African slaves came over. Irish slaves were also on those ships. And then um, taking his history, like where they wanted to breed uh, white slaves with African American slaves for unique livestock, like mulatto and everything. And, and taking. You mean like myself? Well, hey, who knows? You know, but go back to the 1600s, though, when Oliver Cromwell invaded Ireland, and he wasn't such a nice guy. But, um, yeah, the book that we actually want to talk about is, like, I kind of pitched because me and her met in high school at age 15. 
we're now together in our 40s, but we did not date all of these decades. We, we, we actually were just friends in school. I was too scared to ask her out. I'm saying, and we get together a couple years ago, and now we're engaged. So, like, what if we took the people we are now, everything we know, and go back into our 15-year-old bodies? How different would our lives be? Knowing what we know, you know, would our kids be different? Would they look different? Would we even have kids? Uh, would I be a voice actor? Would you be a writer? Would you, you know, all, it's not a literal sci-fi back to the future thing where science matters because it doesn't. It's more just about going back and seeing, you know, consequences of actions and, you know, are you going to get taken seriously as a mature adult in the body of a teenager? You know, when that teenager confronts their parents, are they going to like give any weight to that at all? Are they going to think you're acting weird? We're going to have you like see a shrink or something like, no, you don't understand. I'm 46, <laughs> you know, like and all that. So there's a lot of opportunity for humor and, you know, have a lot of fun. And it's like, OK, if you could go back, we, everyone knows everyone makes mistakes. Everyone has decisions they wish they could just redo if they could go back and just change things about it. And, you know, is your life all the more fulfilled because you had the power to change those things or did you grow from all the awful things that affected your life and every bad relationship or bad decision and could you actually benefit more by turning the negative into a positive so that's kind of the spin of where where we want to kind of just investigate i mean we're doing it for you know entertainment purposes it's not going to be a full-on, like, massive, epic, 500-page novel or anything. A tome. It would not be a tome. No, no. Just something fun. And, you know, based on our history together. Um, but, you know, we want, to, uh, we want to explore that. And it'll be something polar opposite of historical fiction, which is what, you know, her main focus is. All right. And the last question um, before we wrap this up. Talking about turning something negative into positive. Yeah. What is the special panel that your fiance and yourself are creating for cons like this? You Ooh. talked about it yesterday, and I think it's pretty cool after you two talked about it. I mean, oh, great. Thank you. I mean, it hasn't really been done so much. Right, right. I'm noticing after going to cons for, for myself, this is like the 16th year uh, on the anime and pop culture con scene. And what I've noticed is a lot of fans deal with depression. They're bullied. They feel like outsiders. They whether it's abuse from coworkers, friends, family, and an abuse can be a wide envelope of physical, mental, spiritual, whatever, you know, and um, not that my fiance or I proclaim to be gurus or anything like that, but we w would love to start uh, bringing awareness and most of all support, letting people know that they're not alone when they suffer depression. You know, it's one thing to go on a Facebook post and say, Come on, you matter, you got this. And you know, you see a positive meme or maybe your friends say, hey, call me if you ever get sad. It, it, and sometimes in the heat of the moment when things are really, and you're really down in the dumps, it's hard to, to understand and feel like you really do have other people that experience what you have. It's like, and it's not degrading or demeaning to, to say that whatever happened to you doesn't matter. It's, just, it's more about saying, whatever your circumstances, there are people around the globe and probably in this in this very same venue, this this avenue, this forum of pop culture conventions that are just like you, whether they cosplay or whether they work in the industry or whether they're working on staff or, or whatnot. People at some point in their lives, young, old, skinny, fat, tall, you know, it doesn't matter. Depression affects everybody. And so and for some suicide thoughts. Uh, also affect that too. So we want to make sure people know that um, they are valued and that uh, we want to, you know, get some brochures from the suicide prevention hotline and work with the National uh, Association for, for Mental Illness and, and, and get uh, some documentation to help say, hey, here's some numbers, call them. Um, I've dealt with depression myself for, for many years and it, uh, it, it, it manifested for me with a lot of anger, like unsubstantiated anger. It's like, why are you getting so upset over something so little? It's like, well, I don't really know. And then, you know, something for me is just balancing uh, the chemical levels in your brain. So I take antidepressant meds. For me, that was uh, the start to healing and then s seeking out uh, counseling. 
Uh, we're trying to, you know, work as a couple and get counseling together for that sort of thing and, um, and grow as people. That's what you need to do is value yourself. You're not going to be able to love others unless you love yourself first. So if you're dealing with, oh, I hate myself, you have zero self-esteem, you feel like you're on the edge, um, we want to be able to, to bring awareness and hope and positivity and love. And we think this is going to be a huge hit on the convention scene. And we want to encourage people and programmers of conventions around the world to not, you know, we're not going to sit here and say, it's our panel. Not, 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 not saying that at all. We encourage this sort of subject matter be on the program guide or in the programming schedule for conventions so that these kids and grownups and people of all ages can come to these panels and feel like they have a voice and they will be heard and they are cared and loved for. Well, thank you for that. Sure. What would you like to tell your fans as we're wrapping this up? Well, hey, well, without the fans, I wouldn't have such an awesome job because you guys buy the shows, play the games, come to the cons, uh, and make this job happen in the first place. So thank you from the bottom of my heart, and uh, thank you from my fiance's heart, too, for you know um, enjoying uh, what we have to offer in the entertainment realm and hopefully on a personal level, and we can make some resonance um, – with some positivity and love and acceptance. So thank you all um, for uh, letting us entertain you and inform you. All right. And how can people follow you online? All right. I'm at Kyle Abert, which is K-Y-L-E-H-E-B-E-R-T. It's spelt like Hebert, but it's pronounced Abert. So think, a bear is attacking Leo DiCaprio. Oh, poor bear. But yeah. All right. Well, Kyle. Thank you so much for this interview. Absolutely. Folks, this is Joe from my Geek Scene at Midwest Media Expo with Kyle A. Bear. Take it easy.